Okay, hello everybody. Um, so I'm gonna start. No people are coming. Let's wait another half a minute. Okay, uh, hello and uh, welcome to the talk. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, Elasticsearch, uh, pretty new uh, open source uh, project that does uh, mainly distributed search. Uh, this talk is gonna be a bit interesting. I'm gonna try to go with the lightning talk format, which is a bit new to me, but I hope that it's gonna work out well and it's gonna kick ass, but um, I really hope that it's not gonna be a joke, a complete joke, so uh, bear with me if I fail sometime. Let's go, so some things about myself. My name is Shai Banon. Uh, I'm also known as Kimchi, which is basically my username in all the other stuff. So I have a blog at kimchi.org. Uh, Twitter, Kimchi as well. Uh, some information about Elasticsearch. It's open source under Apache license. It's distributed, restful search engine, and the site is uh, elasticsearch.com or .org. You pick your battle. Open source, so Elasticsearch, as I said, is uh, Apache 2 license. It's hosted on GitHub, uh, so the idea is that you can fork, push, pull, send, whatever open issues. Uh, hopefully, we'll get some cooperation uh, for the project. Um, I'm going to cover three main topics today. The first one is one of my core beliefs, beliefs on anything that uh, uh, a product should do when it handles data, and it's basically your data. You're using a pro product in order to manage your data, and in our case, it's actually your search as well. So it's up to you to decide what the data and what the search is. So a product should natively talk the domain model itself and not the other way around. So you have your domain model, and you want it to talk your domain model, and you search on it, and you want it to be able to search on your domain model. So what are the, some of the recipes for a good domain model? So first of all, it has to be document. It doesn't have to be, but it's very nice that it's document-oriented. It will be schema-free. It will include JSON, which seems like the de facto standard of, uh, of any open web uh, application. Um, I'm going to use that as an example with Elasticsearch. So let's try and build ourselves an Amazon store. We'll get to the cloud later. Uh, let's start with the store itself for now. So the first thing that we have with an Amazon store are books. And this is how books look like. So a book has an ISBN and a name, the author that wrote it, how many pages, for example, and some tagging information on what the book looked like. So let's take that book and index it into uh, Elasticsearch. That's very simple. You just curl it into uh, using HTTP. Uh, you index it into an index in Elasticsearch that is called Amazon. Think of an index like a database. Uh, the, the book is the type. Think of it like a database table, even though it's more enhanced a bit. Uh, and you give it the ID. In, in our case, we simply reuse the ISBN uh, number. And now let's, let's try and do some search on it. Let's search for all the fiction books that we have. So you can see that it's a very, very simple curl request that we want to find all the books that has the tag fiction. We get back a result. Let's try and analyze a bit the result that we get back. We get the total hits, in our case one, because we indexed only one document. And for each hit, we can get the index itself that it came from, the type that we have, and the ID itself. And as an added feature, we can actually get the source of the document, actually how it looks like when we indexed it but it can be disabled if you don't want to store the actual document itself and just store indexing information. So our uh, Amazon store is uh, doing well and we want to start selling CDs as well. So let's have CDs. In our case, this is the CD uh, JSON document. So it has some similarities to our book. It has a name as well. It has some tagging information, but it has other fields as well. Again, let's index it, very simple. Uh, book is now the index, uh, sorry, and uh, info is uh, the type, and we simply go ahead and, sorry, 
my uh, slides got mixed up a bit. So city is the index as well, and we index everything. So if we want to search across uh, indexes or types of books, what do we do? We send a curl request, and we can list the types or the indexes that we want to search on. In our case, we search for CD and books. Uh, we can also search for everything. Uh, we can go ahead and search for uh, all the indexes that we have or either or all the types that we want. That's quite simple to do as well. Uh, for example, in this case, we search on all the indexes, all the types for everything that has a name that has a call with it. So we talked about the um, search part. Uh, let's talk about the query DSL itself. Uh, so we're done with the your data part. So we saw how we can index the data itself. Very easy HTTP requests, uh, JSON data, automatically identify fields and everything. Let's move to the uh, your search part. So um, how many people here know Lucene? Probably a lot. <laughs> so uh, Elasticsearch provides a query DSL that is in inspired by Lucene queries. For example, this is how a term query looks like. Very simple. Uh, this is how a term query looks like with the type itself. So let's say I want to search for all the term terms that a book and a name uh, has, a, has the term call within it. Uh, the nice bit about it is that we will only get back results that of type book. So it gets automatically wrapped in a filter and all the fancy schmancy stuff are done automatically for you. Next is our range queries. Um, range query, you can define the actual field that you want to uh, search on, in our case, pages, and we want to search for all the books that has, or uh, CDs, but in this case, it doesn't make sense, uh, that are between 200 and 300 pages. One thing that you can see here, uh, as a lot of people know Lucene, um, Elasticsearch automatically uses the nice features of Lucene for numeric uh, data, so it knows what type of data you're working with thanks to the JSON uh, information that he gave it, and it can uh, use that highly performant uh, numeric queries uh, when possible. And the same goes, I can actually go ahead and search only for books that has pages from uh, 200 and, uh, to 300. There are, of course, many more queries, as there are many more queries in Lucene itself. We can, ha we can uh, search on based on prefix queries, wild qu wildcard queries, uh, an ex uh, uh, and a uh, simplified query parser, which I call field queries, uh, and an actual query parser base query that I provide a query string itself and all the other parameters that the uh, query parser for Lucene uh, can accept. And of course, we can combine all these queries together using a Boolean query. In this case, we have two must uh, closes uh, and um, one must not close and a should close, uh, which are the same ones that you get from Lucene itself. Uh, this works really, really nice, especially for uh, dynamic languages because, because this can be the actual representation of the code that you write when you search your data. Um, let's talk a bit about f filters. So filters in, in Lucene are much faster than uh, queries, mainly because they don't do any scoring and they can be cached quite easily to, to uh, give you uh, even faster access. They are cached automatically by Elasticsearch. Uh, some sab sample uh, filters that are wrapped in the uh, Lucene constant uh, score uh, query. So we can have a term filter. We can have a range filter. Uh, in this case, we're, we're uh, filtering all the, uh, all the, all the uh, books that have pages between 100 and 200. And of course, we can easily combine them with queries as well. Uh, we can use the filtered query to query on all the uh, everything that has a call and wild within the uh, within all the terms that we have. But we want to find only we, we want to find it only within books that have the range of 100 to 200. So range queries are a great, great, great example to use filters. Usually, they don't mean a lot when it comes to scoring. Um, how do you use it in a search request? So before we use the get request, um, get request can also have a body, but not all HTTP clients support it. So you can use post as well, but you can actually s send the re uh, request, a search request as a body itself. And this is how it looks like. Instead of providing the query uh, in the query string as well, uh, in the URL itself, there's a body that 
has the full DSL of the query uh, and the filters and everything that we talked about. And of course, within this body, we can uh, define other search uh, features like highlighting facets, uh, retrieve specific fields that we, that we want to get. Uh, there's an all field that we can uh, search on, which basically search on all your data. Uh, you don't have to pre-specify the, uh, the specific fields that you want to search on. And it can do scrolling of search requests that you have. That's basically the your data, your search part. Uh, the next bit uh, that I want to talk about in Elasticsearch, one of the major cornerstones for it is its uh, distributed nature. Um, so Elasticsearch is a distributed uh, search engine. It, it goes with the usual route of sharding your data or sharding your indices. Uh, it performs automatic shard allocation um, with respect to the number of nodes that you have started. So let's, uh, let's uh, say I start a single node, uh, in our case, and I uh, create an index uh, into Elasticsearch. Uh, Elasticsearch is very much API-centric, so you almost never need to go ahead and fiddle with the configuration of Elasticsearch. You can uh, configure almost everything through APIs. Uh, in our case, I want to create an index that has two shards and one replica per shard. This means that I'll get two shards allocated uh, to this node, and I fire up another node. The replicas now are allocated to the other node, uh, right, because I want to have high availability. Um, if I fire up two, no two more nodes, they, can, they automatically get uh, reallocated, so we'll have evenly balanced uh, number of shards, uh, so we can, we can actually churn as much as we can out of the machines that the nodes are running on. <coughs> when I do an index request, in our case, uh, I want to index a document, a simple uh, book document with ID 1. It doesn't really matter which node I, I hit, uh, but in this case, let's, uh, let's assume I hit the first node, um, and it gets hashed to the first shard automatically by Elasticsearch, and it gets replicated to all the other replicas that we have for that shard. If I index another document, in this case with uh, ID number 2, that node doesn't have that shard, right? So it will automatically uh, reroute that request to the node that has the specific shard that I need to perform the operation on, and it will get replicated to the other replicas as well. A sample search query that we want to execute. So we have, uh, we have ourselves uh, different shards. Uh, we want to be able to search on them. In this case, uh, the search goes, gets to the first node. It gets scattered. Uh, into uh, the two relevant shards that we want to search on, gets reduced back, and we get back the result. Uh, one note regarding that, there's, when, when, you, when you do distributed search, it's quite interesting when it comes to uh, distributed term fre frequencies and stuff like that. Uh, Elasticsearch supports a lot of uh, different modes when it comes to, for you to control how you want your search uh, to be executed, whether you want to accumulate distributed frequencies as well, which means that your search will be a tad slower, but your results will be uh, more properly scored. Uh, again, everything is through the API. Per, per search request, you can control that. Um, just another note, um, just uh, an example about the multi-tenancy aspect of Elasticsearch. Let's say we want to create another index called Amazon2. But in this case, we want to have, in this index, one shard and one replica. That's completely fine. Elasticsearch will automatically allocate those shards uh, on the available nodes. And now I have two indices in my case. Think about the ability to create two MySQL database or something like that. Uh, remember, each index can also have different types, which maps into tables. So I, as, I, as I said before, almost all settings are index-based. You can configure analyzers. You can configure everything that you can think of when it comes to the scene per index through an API, um, which makes it very easy to manage, I think. Some of other distributed uh, aspects that uh, Elasticsearch provides, it provides a per-document consistency. What does that mean? Once you index it, it's there. You don't need to commit flush or anything like that. Uh, it has a transaction log that maintains all the changes that happen. They, that transa transaction log is also replicated. Uh, so basically, once you call the Elasticsearch with an index operation, it's there. You don't have to worry about um, uh, losing your whatever nodes or cluster or something like that, and data won't be there. 
It provides near real-time search. Uh, it's automatically uh, configured to, be, to have a one-second refresh rate. Uh, whoever was here at the previous talk, uh, first of all, I'm really happy that I came to this conference because I, I was thinking about implementing something very similar to what Michael was talking about, and now I know that I don't have to. <laughs> Uh, so it uses the near real-time search that, uh, uh, that Lucent currently provides. There is an API to control if you want to refresh or not. It's a simple POST request to your uh, to a URL uh, with a refresh command. So you can go with a higher refresh rate and you can control when you want to refresh the data. The idea of refreshing the data is when do I want to make all my indexable content visible for search. Um, Let's talk about persistency a bit. So Elasticsearch takes a different approach than uh, other distributed product, uh, NoSQL projects when it comes to how it handles long-term persistency. It's very similar to Apple Time Machine, or actually was inspired by uh, Data Grid right behind uh, technology. Uh, the idea is that you write changes that are done to the index in the transaction log to a shared persistent storage asynchronously but in a reliable manner which causes you to re and you don't have a lot of requirements from that storage um, the the idea here is that you want to uh, treat your uh, local node uh, index as a transient data uh, and you want to have that long-term persistency storage and we'll get to why why it matter it really matters uh, later on and uh, you have that long-term persistency storage uh, that doesn't have a lot of requirements from it. So you don't need to have locking, you don't need to have, to have it to do any caching or anything like that. It's almost always just written to and only very rarely re read from. Just another note on that, the cluster metadata itself is also persisted. So you've created indices, you've set settings on them, on all this stuff. You've created mappings, which I didn't get into. Uh, all of these stuff are also persisted in the long-term story. So if you bring the whole cluster down and bring that back up again, all your indices, all your definitions, everything is already there. What are the storage options that we have with long-term persistency? The first thing that we have is shared file system. Uh, I remind you, one of the problems with distributed system when, it, when they talk about shared file system is that a lot of them requires locking and stuff like that. In our case, we don't need locking. We don't hit the NFS, whatever, bandwidth. Uh, in our um, ongoing operations, it's done automatically in the background uh, in an asynchronous manner. Uh, it also supports uh, Hadoop, so we can write behind to, uh, to HDFS, and it also support, supports cloud, so we can write behind to Amazon S3 or Rackspace cloud files, but we get to that a bit later. I've touched about it a bit uh, before, but what are the requirements from the node storage itself? So each node has its own local storage of the index. It's considered transient. That's very, that's very key. This means that uh, because we can always recover it from the long-term persistency or what Elasticsearch calls a gateway, uh, it can be stored on a local file system in our case, but it, because it's considered transient, we can actually store it in the heap in memory uh, for much faster uh, search and indexing times, if we can fit it in memory. We can also s store it in a native OS memory. There's a patch in Lucene that I've implemented at the uh, Lucene directory that works on top of direct buffers. Uh, and we can also do a uh, file system and memory combination. So we can store parts of the Lucene index files in memory and the other ones on the file system. Uh, remember, uh, I'll give you an example. If you have uh, two indices, one of them is small, but hi it gets hit a lot. And one of them is very, very large, but it's not as heavily hit. We can actually decide to store that single index in memory, uh, still maintain full long-term persistency of that index, get the benefits of doing everything in memory, uh, and, and the other index can be stored in a local file system, which will be a bit slower. The last, the last bit that I want to uh, wanna touch on, and that's basically the uh, uh, native cloud support. Um, so Elasticsearch is easily used outside of the cloud, and it is being used outside of the cloud on local installation. But the architecture itself uh, and the way that it was built 
uh, was also inspired by trying to make people uh, trying to run a search engine on the cloud, on Amazon, or on Rackspace, or it doesn't really matter, uh, as easy as possible. So what do we have in the cloud? Machines are removed and added dynamically, usually. We want to get to the cloud, we want to get it, we want to be elastic. We want to be able to just fire up more machines once the load increases, and we want to uh, kill some machines when the node decreases. Sadly, machi machines also fail more dynamically. So uh, if we got used to our local, uh, uh, local uh, operation uh, set of uh, clusters that we have, uh, and they almost never fail or fail much rarely, then you would find uh, machine failures failing in Amazon, for example. Another important, very important bit is that local, local storage is wiped out. So if I'm using local storage on a specific node on Amazon and I shut down that node, that's it. I don't have that local file system with me anymore. So how do people try and deploy this uh, application on the cloud itself when it comes to storage? So because the local storage itself is wiped out, you go ahead and say, OK, I'll use an external storage. In, uh, I'll use Amazon as an example. So you go ahead and use Amazon EBS. But it needs to be per machine or shard, because only one of them can write to it. And sadly, it can get wiped out as well. So what you end up doing is uh, snapshotting that EBS into S3. Uh, and that's pretty expensive, because then you're paying for both EBS and S3. And the snapshot interval itself is very, very problematic. <coughs> because you, can, you basically don't want to snapshot that EBS into uh, S3 all the time, every se second or something like that. Uh, but creating a large interval uh, basically means that you're uh, widening the window of chance of losing, the da of losing parts of your data. So, um, how, how should it be done in the elastic way? So, we should use long-term persistency. That's great, that's checked. We already have that in uh, Elasticsearch. Um, we should write directly into the cloud, provide a blob storage, Amazon, it's S3, or Rackspace, it's a uh, cloud file itself. <coughs> it is, um, as I said, completely reliable and asynchronous, uh, which means that I'm not going to lose the data. Uh, a subtle note here, uh, basically the idea is that you have uh, the shards, and one of the shards out of the um, shards that we have out of the replication group that we have, that's the one that is responsible for replicating its state into the uh, S3. And if it fails, then the other one will pick up and continue to replicate that uh, into S3. That's configurable through an interval uh, that is around uh, 10 seconds. Of course, with m a lot of systems, uh, the more the, the higher high availability rate that you want is basically by adding more replicas. Uh, the nice bit about Elasticsearch, by the way, is that the more replicas you have, the better search performance that you will get as well, because replica, uh, replicas also handle search requests. So s when you want to scale in Elasticsearch, just by adding replicas, you can scale your search. What's the other bit about uh, native uh, cloud uh, discovery? Uh, so. It's a pain to do discovery in the cloud. Why is that? There's no multicast. Um, and because there's no multicast, it's very hard to uh, do auto discovery. So you go and say, OK, I'll use unicast discovery in a lot of the different products that you have. And here comes the special, those special nodes that uh, I personally very much hate when it comes to distributed systems, because those special nodes need to be the routers or the unicast list that we specify when you start your cloud, your distributed deployment, it means that it, they need to have a persistent IPs, or what Amazon calls elastic IPs, more money that you have to pay to the cloud provider. Uh, and basically, it's very, very much uh, complicate the operations standpoint of trying to manage your, your deployment on the cloud. So how should that be done in the elastic way? Um, so with Elasticsearch, there's a discovery module that supports both multicast and unicast if you want to use it. Um, but it also supports cloud discovery. The idea of cloud discovery is to, to use uh, the cloud provider APIs itself to get the current, li the current list of nodes. So most cloud providers can tell you which, which machines you have already started. 
or which ones are currently being actively started or being shut down. So you can get that list and use that list uh, to go ahead and build your discovery itself. Uh, so no need for multicast, no need for unicast. All nodes are created equal. They go to the cloud provider, ask it for the list of IPs that uh, of the no different uh, machines that are up and do the discovery process themselves. That's it. Uh, that's the end of the session. Uh, so I went through a very brief overview of Elasticsearch. Uh, the current version is 0 0.8. It is in beta. Uh, so <laughs> expect bugs. They are out there. But they are actively being fixed uh, as new features are being added. And please join mailing list, suggestions, code contribution, everything. Uh, welcome anything. Thank you. And now it's your, your turn. What's the, do uh, you have any questions? Yes. Ah, just a minute. Mm. I actually got three questions. Uh, you were talking uh, about uh, your persistent, your data persistency layer being both reliable and asynchronous. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, usually asynchronous, well, so things that are asynchronous or persist asynchronously aren't actually reliable because right. you, you have this window of, of the failure opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I was, I would just um, hear you uh, elaborating on this a little bit more, maybe. And two more questions. Shall I just? Uh, so I'll ask. Uh, I'll answer the first one. So, okay. yeah. So that's a good question. So w when, w how can you say reliable and asynchronous? Uh, so it's, it's, it's exactly the same as you can say uh, my system is highly available because I add more replicas to it. By adding more replicas, you reduce the chance of total failure. Uh, and I can do a right behind uh, in a reliable and asynchronous fashion because I always have replicas that can uh, pick up on a, f a node failure and continue to write uh, the changes that happen to the... Uh, to the backend store or to the local st or to the long-term storage. Okay, so it's so somewhat reliable then. Yeah. So okay. If if you have a total cluster failure or something like that, then you would lose the x so amount of the of time that you have exactly. But it's it's the same thing with the replicated system. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you also said that you would be you can't write to the local storage in the cloud because that is. Uh, Get, gets wiped out, out when, when the instances get lost. So you, you said you would... In cloud, pro you mean in the in cloud? In the cloud, yes. Yeah. So you were suggesting writing directly into the um, um, cloud, well, the, the blob storage, mm -hmm. as you called it, as mm -hmm. an S3, I guess, or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you do that, uh, I mean, how do you do that con uh, continually? Because as with S3, uh, you can't actually kind of stream data into something, and you also have a bit uh, really, I mean, it's, you have some kind of um, latency bef because you actually have the things written down there, written sure. there. How do you deal with that? Sure. So, so first of all, it's important to understand that uh, all search and, and indexing operations happen on the local storage of that node, right? So okay. it's either in memory or local file system. The reliable asynchronous persistency the right behind nature, that's the one that is responsible for pushing the changes into uh, the, the, uh, the S3 or whatever. Um, so this one touches a bit. So first of all, the way that Lucene indexes structure is by, writing, uh, by creating write once segments. So I simply take those segments and flush them into S3 and I, and I split those data if they are above five gigs because okay. that's the limit in, in uh, S3. Uh, and with the transaction log, I simply create a, a, a bucket per interval. Okay. And the final question, then I'm done. I mean, my final question, at least. Um, you, you said that it's a problem uh, to uh, find the other nodes that are within the cluster uh, in the cloud because mm -hmm. there's no multicast. So mm -hmm. you're using the special node uh, thingy. So what? Sorry. So you're using the special nodes, or you're not? Well. Oh, yeah, you so either, that's either, usually what's done. You yeah. either use the special nodes or the cloud API. Mm -hmm. um, why are you not using the um, like things like S3, which is a, a central uh, um, component uh, for, for um, finding all these nodes? Sure. 
So, so basically with Elasticsearch, uh, there's, there's the discovery process and there's also a master election. So a master is elected to be responsible for the, the whole cluster. Uh, of course, if the master fails, then another ma master will be elected. Uh, in order to implement this algorithm, you have to have uh, on top of a different storage, uh, then you need to have oh, on a storage based uh, system, you need to have it um, reflect the latest data that you want to have. Uh, it's basically it's an active election algorithm done on top of whatever S3 and S3 doesn't provide you that right. It's eventual consistent. Uh, you, you could go ahead and said, and I thought about it, implement it on top of SimpleDB, which they added the ability to, uh, to do a read and, uh, and to have a fully consistent read. The, the part here is that no matter S3, SimpleDB, or something like that, there's already an API that doesn't cost you money okay. to get a list of nodes. Okay. So that simply adds more complexity uh, into the system. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Just, uh, just a minute. Uh, I see one index parameter was number of charts. Uh, are the number of charts uh, static, or can it change the number of charts dynamically? Very, very good question. So, uh, so basically, with Elasticsearch, the number of shards are static. So when you create an index, you say I'll have five shards and one replica. Uh, in the future, you will be able to change the number of replicas. That's pretty easy to do. Changing the number of shards, on the other hand, is quite complex because it means that you have to do what we call repartitioning. And that repartitioning process is very heavy, potentially. Uh, it basically means that you'll have to, uh, depends, but most of the times it means that you'll have to re index parts of your data. Now, other systems don't have that problem, like uh, other NoSQLs, because the indexing process is quite lightweight. When it comes to search engine, the indexing process can be very he heavyweight. So if you end up doing repartitioning, you might halt your system for a very long period of time. The way that I've tried to solve it with Elasticsearch is by having the ability to create indices dynamically. So uh, let's take a, um, um, you build a product that um, process uh, log request. So it gets log requests all the time, and you want to be able to search on it. One of the things that you can do is you can create an index per month or in an index per week or something like that, depending on your load that you have. That index can it always can get be can be added dynamically. Uh, if that week, if you expect a week that is going to have a lot of data, you can have different number of shards, different number of replicas, all this stuff. And the nice thing about Elasticsearch, and this is why I've, uh, this is one of the main features that it has, is that you can search on more than one index. So you can say, I'll search for last week, I'll search for, and basically hitting just one index, or I'll search for last month, and you'll hit four indexes. Okay. Um, it would be very, very nice to be able to solve repartitioning automatically, but my guess, and, I'm, I, and I might try to tackle it, uh, but my guess is that it's going to be very, very heavy on the system that you would probably prefer to uh, to do these tricks with uh, dynamic indices instead of uh, having Elasticsearch repartition the data itself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So you saw an example that if you have an Amazon book author, you can search for author in all books? Or yes. Not so is it also that I can search author name for name in distributor, and you you know this chain. Yes. Yeah, so up there's and down. there's yes. And there, there's um, so I also could ask you to search in all books. Is it all possible? Yes. So it has complete path navigation. So it understands the structure of the JSON, and you can uh, basically navigate down the hierarchy of the different JSON objects down to the property that you want, and then search on that. So you can say. Uh, book dot author dot last name something uh, so it has this dot path navigation um, and and of course it also has the other feature which is the all uh, field which basically you, can, you don't have to specify any fields by default it creates an all field that you can search on all of the different uh, data that you have so in Lucene you have to specify the field that you want to search on 
uh, Elasticsearch automatically creates a field that has all the other data for you. So you can search on everything. That, that's very handy because a lot of times you create this very, very, um, you create your domain model, right? And you, wanna, you don't know what you want to search on. You want to search on something on call or whatever, or wild. Uh, and it might be uh, the author name, the, it might be the, 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 the book name, it might be many, many different things. Uh, but you want to search on all of them. And that's what the all field gives you. So that's nearby that I could look to an XML with an XPath to say search only in this No, place. it's not it's not XPath. So basically the, the property navigation gives directs you down to the actual property that you want to search on. <laughs> At the end of the day, that JSON gets trans translated into a Lucene document. So that's a Lucene document at the end. Um, I might have missed it, but how exactly do you differentiate yourself from Solar, which is also a Lucene wrapper? And I think it's a rather obvious question. It seems to me that the replication stuff and everything is more automatic, but other key features, or where do you see differences? Um, uh, first of all, I'm not too familiar with Solar. So I've never used it. Uh, I've just read bits and pieces. Uh, yeah, so one of the major features that I went ahead with Elasticsearch what is, was its uh, distributed nature. Um, I don't know, the API is nicer. The way it handles data is a bit nicer, I guess. Uh, Solar has other features that I plan to catch up, uh, like uh, it has better facet support, um, which, uh, you know, all of these things, all these search features are basically something that Elasticsearch will eventually have. Uh, facet support is already uh, in master, by the way. Um, it's hard. I, I don't know enough of Solar to, to do a, a proper evaluation. By the way, some Solar experts out there or anything, just take Elasticsearch for a ride and, and write a blog post about uh, your expression, uh, impressions from both of them. Any other question? Come on. Yes. Hang on. I'll ask it again. So, can you replicate across data centers? So, that, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, so, when it comes to cross data centers, uh, it really depends. If you have, you know, very very fast uh, connection between the two data centers, uh, I don't know, it, and they're like uh, 50, mi 50 miles away or 50 kilometers away and you might as well just start a, a, a cluster and that's it. Uh, when they are very far away and, it, and the network latency is an issue, then it's, something that, um, then it's something that I do plan to tackle when it comes to Elasticsearch, yes. Yeah, I was actually but thinking across uh, different continents. Yeah, so, so when you go different continents, then there needs to be a way to, the general idea of solving that is basically to create two clusters and have them replicate changes between them. That's the idea. It's also very, uh, the requirements are a lot of times between data centers very different. A lot of times you have a single data, data center that is the master one. You do all the searching on it, all the indexing and everything, and the other one is just backup. Compare it with two data centers that are all the time active, getting index documents and searches and stuff like that. So for example, these are two completely different scale of problems to support. Um, I do plan to support both of them. So maybe I have a question. Um, are you able to change your sharding function so um, that you can basically like use something else for sharding than the ID? Well, I guess you're using the ID. Uh, yes. So uh, the ID is being used. There is a. It's Java. It's built on Juice, so it's very. Easy. You can plug in your own uh, sharding algorithm. Um, so you can shard based on something else or on some other field if you want. Uh, and the nice thing is when, when it comes to controlling how you shard your data, then usually, uh, or how you uh, direct one document to a specific shard, it usually comes together with, uh, with your search request because you have more knowledge and you might be able to say, oh, this search request is special. I only want to hit those shards. 
And that's basically another, f uh, another aspect of Elasticsearch. You can provide it with query hints. Yeah, that, that would have been my next question. Yeah. yeah, so you can provide it with query hints in order to give it a hint and, uh, and, and so it can decide which chart to search on. This is very low level. Uh, there's an a there it can be extended, but you know, <laughs> it's for the experts. <laughs> Any other question? Okay, thank you very much.